Well, let's start out with the passage that I think is probably um, creates the key problem for, for many people when it comes to this issue of, of unanswered prayer. And it's, it's Jesus' words found in John chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. He tells his disciples, and by extension, us, uh, these words. And he says, And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Have you ever prayed for something, claiming that promise, only to be disappointed? Only to feel like, wait a second, you said this, and that's not the deal I got. Like the person who prayed fervently for their mother that they love so much to to be healed of cancer only to have mom pass away. Or to pay, pray for uh, a situation at work to change or a, 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 a relationship with somebody in, in, in your child's school to be made different. Maybe they're being, they're being bullied only to, to, in the end, to have dad fired and lose his job or to have your daughter's situation not get better but actually worse. An author uh, by the name of Natasha Crane, who has a ministry um, uh, of, of trying to uh, instill deep ideas about God and Scripture in, in young people, she tells a story about a time where she wrestled with prayer with her, her kids. She said, my son Nathan wasn't feeling well recently, so we all prayed together for him to feel better. The next night at prayer time, my daughter, my daughter Kenna pointed out that we prayed for him already, but he wasn't feeling better. She had a look of simultaneous confusion and disappointment on her face. In a total of about three seconds, I had the thought that this is the beginning of a lifetime of seeking to understand why God does or does not answer certain prayers. And so I replied, we'll keep praying and trust God that Nathan will feel better. I felt a giant theological error well up in my throat. How often do we casually imply or even consciously think that if we just trust God for a specific prayer outcome, he will answer the way we want. Let's just be honest for a moment. That's probably not your experience. I guarantee you it's not your experience. If you've prayed for any length of time, there are things that you have asked for that have not come about in the way that you asked for them. And so maybe we should do uh, a little more or go a little deeper with our, our, our kids and with our adults about this issue so that we're not left disillusioned later when we do face the problem of unanswered prayer. Because if some of you are honest with yourselves and with, the, with those around you, you go, yeah, I really struggled with that one. Because what it leaves us thinking sometimes, and this is on your insert, I want to encourage you either to follow along on the app or the, the insert uh, uh, that is available to you. Um, these are the kind of questions that well up within us at times. Didn't I pray right? Was there something I missed? Was there an equation in this prayer that I didn't do right? Or maybe, is, isn't God listening? Maybe he's not listening at all. Or, or maybe he's listening, but he isn't powerful enough to do anything. Or worse, maybe he's listening, but just doesn't care. Or worse still, maybe there is no God and this is just a scam. Believe me, those are questions that well up in, in the minds and the hearts of many young people and adults throughout the ages. However, and this, I want to draw you back to your insert. Is it possible, going back to the statement by Jesus in, in John, that Jesus is often, first of all, misunderstood and second of all, misapplied? Is it possible that we have taken Jesus' words and not understood them correctly, and so it has created a crisis that God didn't intend? Because you do know that there are some prayers, even in the Bible, that didn't get answered the way they were prayed. In fact, I want to start off with a heavy hitter right to begin with, Jesus. Did you know that Jesus prayed something that didn't happen the way he prayed it? In the garden, when Jesus is praying before he is arrested and eventually crucified, 
Jesus prays to the Father, please take this cup from me. And that is the cup of suffering that he knows lies ahead, the cross. And what do we know? We know he still went to the cross. Now, Jesus wraps up that prayer, and I think this is a, is, is a helpful way for us to understand the workings of prayer. He says, yet not my will, but your will be done. In the end, God's will is, is done, but his desire is for it to be answered in a particular way. I'll give you another example is the Apostle Paul, another heavy hitter in the New Testament. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul has what he calls a thorn in the flesh. We don't know exactly what it is, whether it was a temptation, whether it was a physical ailment, whether it was an individual who was constantly plaguing him. And he prayed, he says, three times, and I imagine they were intensely intense uh, seasons of prayer. God, deliver me from this. Del take this from me. And God says, nope, not going to do it. In your weakness, my grace and my mercy, my, my strength is shown, proven even more greatly. So maybe, going back to Jesus' words in John, maybe Jesus didn't mean what we sometimes assume he does, and so that that crisis shouldn't be quite the way it sometimes works itself out in our lives. Well, we're going to get back to that passage in John. But before we do, I want us to look at some reasons why the Bible does say that prayers may go unanswered. And this might be helpful for us. I hope it's helpful for you. Uh, let's take a look. The Bible shares some specific personal reasons why prayer goes unanswered at times. There's, two, there, there's other reasons, but two specific ones. One is unconfessed or unrepented sin. There's sin that we knowingly continue to live out in our lives and do not confess and get right with God about. We'll, we'll come back to that in a second. The second is this, wrong motives. That we have wrong motives, selfish-oriented motives uh, that are driving us. Let's look at passages that, that address this. Proverbs 28, verse 9. The writer of Proverbs says, If anyone turns a deaf ear to my instructions, even their prayers are detestable. You know, it's, it's, it's possible that, that, that people want what they want, but they don't actually want to live for God. And so uh, they'll, they'll do and go their own way and, then, and hope and expect that God will intervene. And God says, no, listen, that's not how this thing works. I'm God, and so let's just make sure that you realize that so that, that there's a matter of respecting who I am, that you don't just get to go your own way and then anticipate that I'll show up constantly on the other side. But in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 3 gives a, a very personal uh, thing that maybe sometimes we don't, we don't even think about. Maybe this is a passage you're not even familiar with. In 1 Peter, Paul talks about husbands and wives, and, and he says in verse uh, 3, husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives, and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Now, let me just clarify, He's not, this is not a demeaning passage about women as the lesser uh, uh, in, in the relationship um, or somehow morally or intellectually lesser, that kind of thing. It, actually, in the society, the husbands were the, the head of the house. And what he's going on to say is, I want you to understand, you are in a power structure that allows you to be, you know, Lord of your castle. But he said, I want you to understand, you are co heir you are equal heirs with your wife who also loves Jesus, and that you need to treat her with that sort of respect. He says, otherwise, guess what happens? Your prayers go hindered. In other words, not just our relationship with God and being right with God, but if our relationship with those closest to us are not what they ought to be, that can hinder our prayers in some way. I don't know exactly how, but it can somehow be a barrier. And then James chapter 4, verse 3, James writes and he talks about prayer and he says, When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You want that shiny new bike, that new pony, that new whatever. I, I want, I want, I want, and I'm going to claim it. And James says, nah, nah, not so much. Because there are actually preachers who will tell you that's, that's what God wants for you. He wants exactly what you want. 
Well, it sounds like we've, we've made God in our image if we're not careful. Well, there's a second part to this. There's a couple of reasons I've addressed why we may not have answered prayer, but there are other reasons beyond that, that God chooses to leave prayers unanswered. And these are kind of bigger ideas and, and really, I think, more important for us to understand. The first is this, his glory. I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to say it again. You do realize that God doesn't wake up every morning going, I sure hope Bob is happy. I sure hope Darren is, is happy. Because Darren's happiness, Bob's happiness, is the number one thing on my list. When I get up in the morning, as if God would get up in the morning, my number one thing on my mind is to make sure that you, you're happy. Um, Amy Hall uh, goes on to mention this. She says, sometimes God reveals his glory by answering our prayers the way we hoped. But sometimes he reveals his glory through our learning to depend on him as we experience his faithfulness and trustworthiness through an unchanging trial. In other words, God's glory is first and foremost, not my pleasure. Look at what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. Paul had been through an awful lot in his life as a, uh, an apostle, as a missionary, as a leader in the church. And in verse 8, he says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. We didn't think we were going to make it out of this thing. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Now, we're still alive, but God didn't deliver us from all of those challenges. We actually endured those things so that we might grow in trust of him. And then Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, and he, 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 he's talking here in Ephesians chapter 1 about the, the, uh, the amazing uh, grace of God gifting us salvation um, and is choosing us for salvation. In verse 6, it says, To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. The number one thing on our list in, in, in all the universe is the glory, the praise, uh, the magnifying of God. That's number one. Number two is our good. Actually, Sometimes our prayers aren't answered the way we have asked for them is because God knows it's not for our good. Look at Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, there's a real popular statement in the world, popular culture, that says, hey, everything happens for a reason. Well, I mean, I, there's, I suppose that's, that's true. Um, but what people mean by that is something really good is going to come from this because something bad happened. And, I'm going, well, and, and, then, and then they might go to Romans chapter 8 and say, that's what this says. That's not what it says. It actually says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of, of who? Those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. So um, there's a qualifier here that all of those things may happen as I live in a relationship with God. If I'm outside of that, I don't have that promise. Now, I'm not saying things don't happen that are difficult and challenging that become good in the end for, for others, but that's not what this passage teaches. This passage teaches that God might use even the worst of things for the benefit, the good of his people. And then verse 29, for those who God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. What's God's ultimate goal? That those of us who are his children would look more and more like Jesus. So it might be that there are some trials and some struggles and some unanswered prayers that go along with that in order to, that, to see that purpose lived out. Well, let's go on to um, another statement. Uh, I'm going to give lots of uh, give credit to Amy K. Hall in an article that she wrote. And she says, we know that every answer to every prayer is working towards these two goals, even if we can't see how his answer is accomplishing those things. So I say that to, to help us understand 
that when in those moments of crisis, things aren't going the way we'd asked or that we'd hoped or we'd assumed, to realize two things are at play. The glory of God and the building up of me as his, me, you as his child for our good, whatever that looks like, even if I don't understand why. Well, there are two reasons in particular why we may be confused in light of the, those above things. A couple of reasons why we go, yeah, I, I, I hear that, but I, I still can't wrap my brain around it. Well, there's reason for that. Number one, we might not have enough knowledge to evaluate his response to our prayer. Is that possible? If you ever have a child come up to you and ask you for something, you go, there is no way that's going to happen. But mom, but dad, well, it's, it's 30 below. You, you have to wear a coat. I, I, I hate that thing. Don't you love me? Let me do what I want. Well, I do love you, and that's why you don't get what you want. Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, and then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. He says there's limits to what we know. God is God, and I am not. Tim Keller, a uh, pastor out in New York, uh, writes talking about prayer. And he was praying uh, fervently for a particular answer to prayer, and he didn't get it. And then later, as he matured and reflected, he says, but as I look back, God was saying, son, when a child of mine makes a request, I always give that person what he or she would have asked for if they knew everything I know. That's a powerful statement. So recognize that when God's answer is no, it's maybe because it's got a better yes. Job. If you've ever read through the book of Job, your heart goes out to the guy. I mean, all this stuff is happening behind the scenes. His family's taken from him, his, his wealth, his health. And yet he remains faithful to God. And yet he's, he's passionate, he's angry. He's God, I, I deserve a hearing with you, God. Come and explain yourself. And so he finally gets a hearing with God in, in Job 38. And here's what God says. Well, before I answer your question, Job, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me, if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. In other words, he's helping Job be put in his rightful place. There are things that are beyond you, Job. And so you're just going to have to trust me. The second thing that, uh, that comes to mind as we, we struggle with understanding the above is sometimes we might have lesser goals in mind when we pray. I'm sure that's never possible for you. I mean, I mean goals, and let's just be honest. I mean, sometimes we, we pray for our comfort. I mean, my, my leg hurts, God. Please heal me. My child won't go to sleep. Please heal that situation. Please give me relief. Please, please end my weariness. And I'm not saying those are wrong motivations. It's, they're not sinful, necessarily. They may just not be the higher thing that God has in store in that moment. And then Amy Hall mentioned something that I think is really important. In, in the midst of... You know, I'm sitting across from somebody who is struggling with an unanswered prayer. I could give all the theological reasons why God may have done this or not done that. But I'm actually sitting across from somebody who, who might care less about that. They're just hurting. They're just deeply wounded. It's very personal. And she says, sometimes grief just has to be gone through. And the best we can do is to try to bear up under it in a way that brings us closer to God rather than pushes us away from him. Sometimes there just isn't a simple answer to that. We can give all of these reasons, and that might be helpful, but there may be times where we should go, it's just, it just stinks. So what do we do in those moments? We'll take a look at the next part of your insert Another quote from Hall, she says, when it comes to unanswered prayer, the only thing that can sustain us is trust 
in God's sovereignty and goodness and specific love for each of us. Let me break uh, those down. We talk about God's sovereignty. Sometimes we use words again in the church. We go, what in the world does that mean? I don't, I don't use that language. Well, sovereign means he's in control. So when we're, we're talking about trusting God's sovereignty, we're trusting that he's in control, even if I don't fully understand what's going on. I trust that he's on his throne. Even as I look at a world in chaos, I trust that he's on his throne, and he's not surprised. And you'll notice that there are a number of quotes from, from Hall here that I just thought were so good I, I, I couldn't leave unquoted. He said, when we can only know that there's a reason for our suffering if we also know that he could change our situation but isn't. Think about that for a moment. We're praying for God who is in control of all things, who loves me, and who is not answering my prayer the way that I had asked for, but he could. But if he doesn't, that must mean that he has something else in mind. And so here's the point, she says, that our lives are not out of his control and filled with meaningless pain. You see, one of the challenges of a godless world of an atheistic view is pain doesn't have any, any purpose. It doesn't make sense. I, I can't give somebody confidence and encouragement in the midst of that. But here, I can have a confidence that even if I don't get what I was hoping for, I trust God is still working out something even as painful as it might be. But I also know with a Christian view of things, this won't be the last note to be played. There's something better on the other end. And then the second part of this is God's goodness and specific love, keeping those things in in mind, that God really is good. I was talking with somebody last night who was going through a real uh, challenging season in his life. And he didn't have an answer for the challenge he was going through. He's not sure exactly what's next. But then he said, but I, I know this. That God is good. That God is, God is faithful and present. And I know that may not be great comfort to you if you're enduring this right now. But I can, I, when I look at men and women of great faith throughout history. And they have gone through deep seasons of of pain. That's what they'll tell you. That God is good. That God is good and that God God is loving. And when I talk about specific love, I mean that God has a, a love for all of humanity, but he also loves us individually. You see, in the midst of those times when God does not appear to be answering our prayers the way we would hope, Maybe the question is, how can we stay close to him? Because let's just be honest, sometimes you go, I'm a little ticked at God. That he didn't answer the way I'd hoped for. Well, what I'm going to say is, bring it to God. I feel distant from him because he seems silent. Draw near to God. In fact, James says, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. But I want to give you some some other things to uh, to, to help undergird that. Number one. We keep faithful and trusting him by continuing to, to know him more by reading the Bible. I, I know that seems like simplistic, but it's not. Because part of the problem is mo- many people in the church, let's just be honest, don't really know the Bible well. And, and so if you go, oh, that's me, I go, it, it, it's a lot of us, okay? And when we're in dark seasons of the soul, we go back to the few things we do know. And sometimes they're very limited and sometimes they're not even accurate. But what I can encourage you to do is to draw into the Word of God. And as you get to see and understand God more fully, you start to realize that he's up to something bigger than just eliminating this particular pain in my life. I start to know the character of God, his faithfulness, his goodness, his love. So draw into God's Word. Even in a moment when you feel like that's the very last thing I want to do, I invite you to do it anyway. Number two is continuing to pray even when you didn't get the expected answer. Have you ever had a child ask you for something and they didn't get what they wanted? And then how do they respond? And they go off in the corner, and they, go, they go off in the corner, and they kind of uh, go off in a huff. And they give you the silent treatment. I'm not gonna talk to you. And now understand, 
maybe we do that with God sometimes. I'm not going to church. I'm going to show him. You know, I mean, God's like, yeah. okay. Um, the reality is we're hurting ourselves in that. But, but I, I think there is that sense. Let's just be honest that sometimes we're, we're hurt, we're, we're confused, we're frustrated, and we want God to know it. I, I want to invite you to do the opposite of that. And to remember that God is not doing this because he doesn't love you, because he does love you. And he has something even greater in store in the end. Draw close to him in prayer. Because it may be in that season of unanswered prayer that other prayers get answered more fully in ways you could never have expected. Number three, by continuing, continuing in connection with the family of God. Boy, the, what often happens is not only am I ticked at God, but I'm just going to take it out on the church. Or I'm ticked at the church, I'm going to take it out on God. I, I'm going to invite you not to do that. Yeah, the, the church is full of broken people and hypocrites and stuff. I understand that. We'd welcome one more. You know, come on in. Because um, we all are that. But even the world has figured this out. Why do you think groups like AA are so effective and therapy and, and people go to counseling and they hang out at bars because everybody knows their name because they need to know that in the midst of their confusion and brokenness of life there are other people walking the journey with them and guess what you're not alone in the struggle because it's quite likely the person sitting, in fact, I can guarantee you the people on either side of you are also going through some other kind of struggle. We're in this together. We're fellow travelers. But in the midst of that community, God shows up in amazing ways. Well, let's go back to that passage in John, John 14 again. Uh, I, I don't have the, the quote up there, but I, I'll quote it to you. Jesus says, you ask anything in my name and it'll be done for you. I said it's possible we've misunderstood that. Well, here's, here's a couple of answers to that. Number one, to pray in Jesus' name is not a magical mantra like abracadabra in Jesus' name. And there will be, be people that will write books about five ways you can get your miracle. And it's like if the name of Jesus doesn't work, we'll, we'll, we'll layer it over with the blood of Christ. We'll pray the blood of Jesus over it. And they think it's like magic. That would be wrong. That's not what it meant then. That's not what it means now. I, the name of Jesus is powerful, but it's more than just magically saying the name. The second part is an explanation. You see, to pray in Jesus' name is to pray in his will. To pray as he would if he were in our situation. Let's be honest, sometimes we don't get what we ask for because we just don't know. We don't know best. And so when you prayed in somebody's name or you stood in somebody's name in the ancient world, you were representing them. And so Jesus is in essence saying, as you come to be in line with my understanding of things, I guarantee you, the Father will answer that. But not just if you magically ask for that shiny new toy and throw my name on the end of it. That's not how this works. In a book written back in the 1950s by Ralph Sockman called The Higher Happiness, he describes the true intention of prayer. And I love this image. He says, we use prayer as a boatman uses a boat hook to pull the boat to the shore and not to try to pull the shore to the boat. We reach out to God in prayer, not to pull him in our direction, but to pull us in his direction. So go back to your insert. Maybe unanswered prayer at times, rather than being God's silence or ignoring us, is actually his tool for shaping us into Christ's image. So this next statement is, is, is really important, particularly in a world, in a, in a church world that sometimes get this, gets this confused. We believe then in a God who can, but not in a God who always does what we ask from him. Some of you will know the name Ed Dobson. Ed was a pastor for many years at Calvary, on uh, Calvary Church on East Beltline, big Big church. Um, 
Well, back in the fall of 2000, doctors diagnosed Dobson with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. It's incurable, it's fatal. And the doctors gave him two to five years to live and predicted that he would spend most of that time in a disabled condition. Well, shortly after he was diagnosed, Dobson wanted someone to anoint him with oil and pray for healing. I, I understand. And so he wanted someone to pray who really believed in healing. And that, I mean, let's just be honest. Sometimes we've been asked to pray for things. Man, I'll pray it, but man, I'm not sure, you know. I, that, thank you. Next. You know, but I want somebody who, who really, you know, believes firmly in God's ability to, to answer. So Ed invited a friend, a, a Pentecostal pastor who had regular healing services to come over and pray for him. And here's how Dobson described what happened. This was one of the most moving evenings of my entire life. He began by telling stories of people he had prayed for who, who were miraculously healed. But he also told stories about people who he had prayed for who were not healed and had passed away, receiving that ultimate and final healing. But before he prayed for me, he gave me some advice. Don't become obsessed with getting healed, Ed, he said. If you get obsessed with getting healed, you will lose your focus. Get lost in the wonder of God, and who knows what he will do for you. And then Dobson says, this is some of the best advice I've ever received. Since that night, I've been trying to get and stay lost in the wonder of God. Now, what's amazing is though the doctors gave Dobson two to five years, he actually passed away in 2015, about 15 years later. So God did extend his life, but he didn't get the answer that he had prayed for. But I want to in, in, invite you to pray nonetheless. We don't always know what God might do, but we, we want what God wants, and it may in the end be the healing we've hoped for, but it may not be as well. But in the end, we want what God thinks is best. Take a look at this next statement on your, your insert. You see, the problem with so many people's view of God and unanswered prayer stems from viewing him like an equation. If I put A plus B, it'll equal C. You know, if I pray this way, this many times, I'll get my healing. Or we think of God as a blessing machine or a magic lamp. If I just rub the genie lamp the right way, I'll get what I've asked for. But I want to suggest this, that I think a better way forward, and I think a more biblical way forward, is to view God as a good father. As a good father. In fact, Jesus said so. These aren't my words, these are Jesus. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 7. He says in verse 7, Ask and it will be given to you. That seems pretty Black and white. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks the door will be open. What he's saying is God is a God who wants to be found. So seek him. Ask. Knock. But then in verse 9 he goes on to say, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So I want you to get the heart of the Father here. In other words, as a good father, he longs to give good gifts to his children. But sometimes children are not fully aware of what good means. So even though we, we don't know why, sometimes where God is at in the midst of it, we can trust that he is good, that he's faithful, that he knows best, and that he loves us. So let me just kind of wrap up this way. If you've ever struggled with this issue of the silence of God, know that you're not alone. Job wrestled with that. King David a man after God's own heart wrestled with that. Paul wrestled with that. So please don't fall prey to the lie that the reason prayers don't get answered are always due to a sin in your life or to a lack of faith. Though Those sometimes are the issue. It is possible to cry out to God with a clean heart and even healthy motives as best you can tell, and still God says no. It's okay. 
One of the reasons we take communion is a reminder of that story, a reminder of that tension that we live between the now and the not yet, the yet to be fulfilled, the return of Jesus. We, we stand between the cross of Christ and the second coming, the resurrection and his return. And so I want you to follow along on this. There's a, a longer quote by Amy Hall and then an end of scripture by Paul in 2 Corinthians. She writes about the cross. She says, with the cross and the resurrection at its core, Christianity need never deny the reality of evil and suffering because Jesus has proven himself to be greater than all of it, greater than evil, greater than suffering. He didn't just overcome it. Listen to what she says. He, he overcame through it. The cross was the very means by which he secured joy. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame from Hebrews 12. And in the same way, all evil will be swallowed up. We will, in our resurrection, see that, we suffer, that what we suffered was the means by which we gained joy in the eternal weight of glory produced by our affliction. We'll turn the suffering we experienced into a drop of dye lost in an ocean. Sometimes we're tempted to think evil is stronger than God, but when we understand that every attempt evil makes to harm us is working for our good, we'll see that all of evil's weapons have been removed from it. There is nothing left it can use against us. I hope that the next time you face a challenge, you'll remember the cross. And Paul puts it this way. Therefore, we do not lose heart, Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That's why we're called to faith. As we come to communion... It is our faith story. It's a reminder that the worst things aren't the last, that, that Jesus didn't end in the grave, that he, he rose three days later. As a testimony, at the end of history, that will be our story. And that all that is evil and all that is unjust and all that is painful will finally be washed away where there will be no more mourning or crying or tears or pain. As we come to communion, I want you to keep that view in mind. And maybe for you, that's exactly what you needed because for you, it has been a dark season, an unanswered prayer season. And to know that God is still on his throne, that God is still good, that he still loves you, and that he's still going to bring about all that he had planned. If you're a, a, a Christian, I want to invite you. You don't have to be a member here, but if you're a Christian and follower of Christ, so I invite you, encourage you to join with us in communion. After I pray, you can go to where the trays are at and grab the, uh, the set of two cups and then bring them back to the chair. And just you and Jesus uh, spend some time in encountering one another. Let's pray. Jesus, as we come to communion, we're reminded of your faithfulness. We're reminded even when in, in your humanity, you didn't want the, the, the pain of the cross and the pain that was before you. And yet, at the end of the day, you wanted what the Father wanted. And so you set the model for us. Thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, help us, uh, strengthen us, maybe even those right now who are enduring difficult trials, physical, emotional, financial, relational, um, uh, just unknowns. And Lord, may you show yourself faithful in the midst of that. And as we come to communion, Lord, may you show yourself real and present in this time as you bless this meal. In Jesus' name.